Hello, hello, and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture ebook. Preparing for the Day After is a <clears throat> photojournalistic treaty on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar, and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian tsunami. Tonight, I will be starting reading of chapter 21 instead of chapter 20. The chapter 21 is on interagency coordination, and chapter 20 is going to be read next week. It's chapter on the role of bio shields in disaster mitigation. I will be able to finish reading the chapter 21 on interagency coordination tonight, but I will. it will be a bit of a longer video. I decided to interchange tonight's reading because interagency coordination may be useful in times of war that we are unfortunately witnessing. But let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading sessions before we start tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agro meteorological condi uh, conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agro meteorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal health care access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Tonight we will start with a chapter on interagency coordination in mitigating disasters. The sheer scale of the disaster that unfolded in the aftermath of the Asian tsunami made it plainly obvious that a multi-pronged response was imperative to reignite human civilization itself. 6,065 human mortalities in one district itself within a couple of, couple of hours benumbed the government like never before. Thousands of stranded people people had to be evacuated to shelters or safety. Within an hour of the calamity striking the coast of Nagapatnam the, in Tamil Nadu, the authorities had started moving the mortalities to the government general hospital in Nagapatnam. The tsunami hit Kadalor district uh, at 9.02 a.m. and Nagapatnam about 15 minutes later. The restless sea created curiosity amongst the coastal fisher folk, many of whom ran seaward to collect both their rocking craft and gear and to collect dying fish on the sands after the first preceding wave. That's 6,065 souls from Nagapatnam. <clears throat> They were caught in the second wave and could not be rescued by onlookers at all. Others were trying to salvage what the tsunami washed off from their modest homes. In Kadalor alone, 38 relief camps were set up for housing a total of 24,204 survivors. Another 61,054 homeless people had to be evacuated to the safety of shelters. The tsunami made inroads well into the hinterland, damaging constructions, establishments. It seemed to be annihilating civilization itself with a vengeance, as it were. Whole fishing villages, coastal belts, coconut plantations, agricultural lands, aquaculture, farms, they were all smashed flat. 51 hamlets were affected by the tsunami in Kadalor alone, leaving 99,704 people among 11,804 families affected. The loss of lives in Kadalor district was 610, lives that possibly could have been saved with better preparedness maybe. A further 38 persons were missing. Loss of livestock amounted to 138 cows and buffaloes and 811 sheep and goat. 317.93 hectares of agricultural crop was damaged and 199.26 hectares of horticulture crop was damaged. To mitigate the impact of hydrometeorological disasters, which are more frequent than a tsunami, like a, which is a hydrogeological disaster, on agriculture, long-term ecological measures like watershed management, rainwater harvesting, enriching soil nutrition through soil conservation measures will pay off otherwise too in mitigating the impact of flash floods. Catchment area conservation automatically prevents flash floods. The district administration had to incohate the uh, logistical support of myriad agencies. The Central Public Works Department was entrusted to work with port authorities, Andaman and Lakshadweep Harbour Works Department, Andaman Public Works Department to restore the jetties, wharves, berths and fires at all the harbours, big and small, to restore infrastructure for transshipment of relief material, the Central Public Works Department had to reconstruct the damaged airstrip also immediately. 
the Department of Food and Civil Supplies worked with the Census Department to ensure food rations were distributed to all survivors. The Department of Telecom had to restore existing cables and render functional those that were damaged. The Indian Reserve Battalion conducted mass cremations and mass burials. We had to recover bodies strangled inside coconut tree fronds. Whole families had been washed away. None was there even to claim or identify the corpses. We brought down the corpses from the treetops and identified them as being clad in red dresses or skirts, grey pants or shorts, etc. After we recovered all the corpses, we conducted mass funerals. All corpses were laid in mass graves. We poured gallons of diesel and petrol on them and lit them a fire en masse. It was heartbreaking, madam. It was very depressing, said Mr. Thiagi, an assistant sub-inspector of the Indian Reserve Battalion in Port Blair, to me in a conversation with me in Diglipur. At any given time of natural calamity or any kind of emergency, the paramilitary forces will assist the civilian administration on receiving a request. We render all possible assistance, making available all resources, manpower, logistics, support and supply systems, but we retain the command structure of logistics. Though the Air Force station, Air Force station's housing complex at Khan Nicobar collapse and the Air Force personnel suffered 122 casualties, the Air Force station was the first to respond to the calamity. The Air Force was able to transport supplies from the mainland in four hours flat. This was so vital to ensure that the supply chain was not affected. The planes were loaded in Car Nicobar and had to airlift cargo and supplies to other islands in the Nicobar Islands, unquote, said Commander Anil Kumar, the public relations officer of the United Command at Port Blair in Andamans, uh, who told me this in an exclusive discussion in the Jarawa canteen on the 9th of January 2007. Transport aircraft were taking off from Port Blair's modest airstrip at the rate of one plane every minute, sorry, every alternate minute uh, in that first week after the calamity. Naval divers were deployed to recover corpses washed out to sea and to enumerate the dead and missing. According to Mrs. Ankita Mishra, the former Deputy Commissioner of the Nicobar District, uh, quote, the administration had to take up rescue and recovery immediately on a war footing, then ensure that life goes on as smoothly as possible for the traumatized survivors and then commence rehabilitation and rebuilding in the second phase. The first phase of rescue and recovery included emergency measures such as search and rescue of survivors, recovery of the wounded and traumatized, missing people attend to the wounded and the injured, airlift them to hospitals for medical aid and treatment, supply food rations for the survivors, ensure there are no starvation related deaths, ensure drinking water supply for the survivors, clear the debris from the tsunami, cremate and bury the dead, dispose of the carcasses of cattle and casualties, and sanitize the affected areas to prevent outbreak of epidemics in the aftermath of the calamity. All of these had to be done within the critical period of the first 36 hours after the calamity. So you can imagine the daunting task ahead of them. This impact of the tsunami on the livelihoods of survivors had long-term impact. Loss of livelihood meant negative impact on food security, mal malnutrition of, of weak and vulnerable, inability to repay loans on time meant increase in interest rates, dependency on aid distribution, affected confidence levels leading to anxiety and then long-term health effects like increase in hypertension as well as depression and mental health problems. The Central Food Technology Research Institute packaged culture-sensitive food packets, nutrition packets for airdrop in the affected areas and this went a long, a very long way in mitigating starvation in the aftermath of the calamity. Teams of psychologists and counselors from the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, which is an institute of national importance in India, the Church of North India and the Bible Society of India offered counsel and heard the traumatized villagers. Recovering the corpses and sanitizing the tsunami ravaged landscape was not just a macabre duty but critically significant in a disaster scenario. Cross-checking the population lists was also a necessity at the time of relief and compensation given the fact there was also a deluge of illegitimate applications from mistresses and even survivors from Sumatra. The complex web of demographic profile given the history of resettlement of various ethnic groups in India's post-independent history in Nicobar only complicated enumeration of the dead missing and the verification of settlers in the islands. A government officer in Port Blair lost his brother and sister-in-law in the tsunami, yet he was unable to help his aged parents get compensation for the loss of their son and daughter-in-law till 2009. When, when I inquired with DC Ankita Mishra, who took over as deputy commissioner at the end of the first stage of relief, uh, just before rehabilitation commenced in January 2007, she said, quote, we are doing regular monthly review 
reviews in specific cases like this case, we would appreciate if they can approach us with details of requisition and documentation. You see, in 5% of the cases, the administration becomes very challenging. There are illegitimate wives seeking compensation. In some cases, we are faced with litigation. We shall certainly look into it if we get a detailed requisition." Unquote. Other challenges like demining the booby traps and minefields laid by the Japanese in the Second World War hamper reconstruction. In Kadalor district of Tamil Nadu alone, the cost of communal feeding was at the rate of 65,000 rupees for breakfast, rupees 130,000 rupees each for lunch and dinner for 7,785 survivors in 38 relief camps. Food was served to 80,000 persons in Nagapatnam relief centers. In accordance with the guidelines in India, relief camps cater to the food and nutrition needs in the aftermath of a calamity for a week or 10 days at the most. Thereafter, survivors are housed in shelters and are given relief material, including food rations, to usher in self-reliance. That apart, water supply bladders had to be distributed, water desalination plants had to be de installed, water treatment for sanitation infrastructure in relief camps had to be overseen. People trying to escape were caught in debris that was swirling in the tsunami waters. Broken homes, floating utensils, enmeshed corpses left a macabre and a shocked impression on survivors, paralyzing even the administration. Debris caused injury to survivors and constructions like fish landing, jetties, markets, etc., which collapsed in the mighty wave, causing injuries to those surviving on dry land. The tsunami affected places in Tamil Nadu were spared the impact of the mega earthquake that triggered the tsunami. <clears throat> Thus, the tsunami was more calamitous than the earthquake in Tamil Nadu. Bridges had collapsed, roads were damaged, communication links had snapped. Power supply connections sapped with infrastructure damage, leading to impediments in treatment of injured communication networks. <clears throat> Emergency, evacuation, recovery, all of these activities are dependent on power supply. Hospital staff themselves were affected, ca causing undue stress on health department, given that thousands of survivors were in need of treatment as well as counseling. Makeshift hospitals, relief centers and food distribution centers sprung up literally overnight in some places even before sunset on the day of the tsunami in Nagapatnam and Kadalor. Although volunteers tried to help in clearing the dead bodies, woohoo shortage of infrastructure support meant cadavers had to be carried on two-wheelers. There is one photograph of that somewhere here. There was serious risk of disrespect to the dead as well as the health risk to the generous volunteers. In some places, bleeding or injured survivors were seen volunteering, carrying the dead to hospital morgues. In these circumstances, it became the responsibility of the district administration to coordinate all relief effort, including volunteers are not legally accountable, unlike the administration. The administration must also manage search and rescue, recovery, distribution of relief, identification of the dead, installation of a process for quick compensation and distribution of death certificates for mass mortality management and treatment of injured. It was this extreme challenging scenario that prompted the documentation of lessons learned to pave the way for the concept of their interagency coordination in team effort for disaster mitigation. With breakdown in communication links, information paucity only confounded the misconceptions and lack of information. Even though the Nagapatnam district is used to challenges of natural calamities, including the floods in October and November of 2004, the tsunami initially caught the people totally unawares on account of the fact that it was unknown and the shock aggravated the situation. Given the district's vulnerability to hazards like cyclones and floods, it was realized and decided after the tsunami that disaster safe shelters and architecture made economic sense. Hence, concepts like rainwater harvesting were incorporated into design and construction of new houses built for those rendered homeless by the tsunami. Since it was the first time that the administration had to take up the task of rebuilding civilization, as it were, incorporating disaster risk disaster safe architecture elements also became the responsibility of the disaster of the district administration it is now a best practice the district officials visited Belangani, a pilgrim center 11 kilometers north of nagapatnam and the bishop of Belangani made a commitment to take care of the food and also arrange local volunteers to remove the dead bodies such efforts augment coordinated relief work in fact a stunt district administration called the dc that is the deputy commissioner of tanjavur or tanjore district saying the sea is flooding land. By the nightfall on the day of the tsunami, over 80 relief centers had sprung up all over coastal fishing villages in Nagapatnam district of Tamil Nadu. 490 districts 
sorry 490 doctors government doctors were 310 plus private doctors 180 uh, staff nurses 239 government that was which included government nurses at 187 and private nurses were 52 and other paramedical staff included 563 in number total number 73 medical camps and mobile camps were conducted covering about 185 kilometers of nagapatnam coastal area 65 ambulances were present pressed into service in nagapatnam district whose district general hospital itself was largely damaged and inundated. Yet, according to the then collector, Dr. J. Radhakrishnan, who is now the health secretary of the government of Tamil Nadu, uh, there were neither any injuries nor mortalities in the government hospital thanks to the efficient evacuation as well as shifting of the patient in patient. 13,566 temporary shelters built at over 50 locations. Government and NGOs partnered in construction. Disaster management is defined as the managerial function charged with creating the framework work within which communities reduce vulnerability to hazards and cope with the disasters. It involves planned steps taken to minimize the effects of a disaster, according to Dr. J. Radhakrishnan, the then district collector of tsunami hit Nagapatnam. Disaster-proof housing and shelters with adequate water and sanitation and ready to serve medical preparedness besides adequate food stock is considered a disaster-ready human settlement. In Nicobars, however, disaster is synonymous with tsunami. There is, there is no air ambulance in the forlorn volcanic islands. There is no physiotherapy department in the government-run BJR hospital. And according to a written reply elicited for a right to information article, right to information application filed by me, I got a response which I quote, each human settlement is not having fire station, fire engine and ambulances in Andaman Nicobar Islands. The population served by a fire station in An Andaman Nicobar Islands is 1 is to 604 islanders, which is woefully inadequate. Regarding earthquake safe certification, officers say no explicit earthquake safe certification is necessary because structures built by the Andaman Public Works Department adhere to building code and withstood shaking and aftershocks after the mega earthquake. There is nevertheless a need for earthquake safe certification by none less than the UNDP. The permanent shelters built by the Government of India in conformance to cultural sensibilities of indigenous Nicobaris on stilts, for instance, may not withstand vigorous shaking during frequent and powerful earthquakes in geologically volatile Nicobars. You will see many pictures of the house built by the government of India in this uh, in today's video. The stupendous impact of the tsunami on lives and livelihoods gave rise to the whole new concept of identifying vulnerable people, hazards and vulnerable areas to natural calamities and helped resolve efforts to mitigate the impact of calamities on vulnerable populations. Disaster mitigation. Disaster risk reduction is a systematic approach to identifying, assessing and reducing risks of disaster by reducing exposure to hazards, lessening vulnerability of people and property, wise management of land and environment and improving coping capacity and preparedness against disasters, says Dr. Radha Krishnan. IAS, former collector of the Nagapatnam district, in an exclusive email interview to me for this book. A whole gamut of official agencies with command and control hierarchical structure was needed to deliver relief and reduce the impact of disaster on the affected populace. Incident commander doubles up as operation chief and planning chief. The already available zonal secretary of information and technology department continues to assist. The 73 affected inhabita habitations divided into seven contiguous habitations each. A minister or a board chairman made in charge of each governing seven habitations. Covering, I beg your pardon, let me read that again. A minister or a board chairman was made in charge of each uh, habitation, each of the seven habitations which were covered under each jurisdiction, so to say. 11 collector level officers are made team leaders of the self-contained relief team supervised by ministers. Daily operational briefings started. Financial flexibility was given. Team setup were incident commander doubles up as operation chief and planning chief. The already available zonal secretary of information technology continues to assist. 73 affected inhabita habitations were divided into seven contiguous habitations each. A minister or a board, board chairman, I think this is a repetition I'm going to cut. The district administration had to monitor the delivery of coordination efforts. For this, 10 Indian administrative 
service officers were appointed each mandated to coordinate the interagency efforts and disaster mitigation around the 1000 officers and staff of the nagapatnam district and 380 other districts worked around the clock about 200 army officers and jawans and naval officials assist the district administration in the rescue and relief operations one dig that is uh, deputy inspector general of police and seven superintendents of police 110 other police officials and 1361 other rank officers monitored the situation and ensured peace in the district 69 jcb machines 30 forklanes 64 tipper lorries 14 bulldozers and 13 cranes were engaged an exclusive web website to trace the dead injured and missing persons were created on a particular wing the link which will be put up put up here a database created a track to track the aid material received go down wise to ensure proper accounting and distribution based on demand assisted by a district project officers of the rural development one deputy collector logistics function operation functions headed by dead body disposal and sanitation of by the municipal commissioner medical task force task force of had a medical officer electrical special tasks or the assistant engineer of the tamil nadu electricity board water task force or had one assistant executive engineer of the tamil nadu water board debris clearance had the ade this is that is uh, assistant divisional engineer of highways police strike team was headed by deputy superintendent of police and there were two such teams chief minister announced initial relief on 28th of 12 2004 which included supervise and start close relief camps the priorities for those teams were removal and safe disposal of dead bodies restoration of water electricity roads communication and transport distribution of relief materials that it is in government had to coordinate with the ngos reduce panic and build public confidence build temporary shelters and get people back to their dwellings restore other important services like schools child welfare centers health posts etc supervise and start or close relief camps helplines and disaster mitigation control rooms had to be manned 24 7 with control rooms obviously trained volunteers were at a deficit and trained staff were was saddled with infinite responsibility the nagapatnam district administration set up an NGO coordination center to take on responsibilities beyond the delivery capacity of the administration. It fell upon the NGOs to monitor food distribution, issuance of death certificates, coordination, coordinate for completion of mass burials, cremations, counseling and survivors, etc. Counseling the survivors, etc. The health department also had to undertake regular fumigation to prevent breakout of epidemics. I think those visuals have just gone by. Daily disease surveillance was taken up by the district administration in conformance to WHO stipulations. Among the responsibilities of the district administration were medical relief at affected villages and shelters, disinfection throughout the areas, chlorination, water, chlorination and water quality analysis, contact treatment prevent I, uh, tt measles polio immunization vitamin a supplementation setting up microbiological labs for diagnosis and backup of data treatment of minor ailments measures for anti-fly and anti-mosquito drive food distribution and sanitation services and relief centers disease surveillance health education technical advice on disposal of dead bodies death registration etc online disease surveillance idsp cell information at collectorate sending daily reports to the government extra extra ordinary efforts undertaken to contain the spread of epidemics confirmed by the confirm, confirmed by who 120 medical teams were organized at all relief camps and villages animal camps started in many places for the welfare of cattle mass cleaning of municipalities was organized rapid restoration of water supply electricity and breach of roads protected drinking water was ensured scientific method adopted for quick decomposition of dead bodies and carcasses three tire psychosocial support and trauma care using experts organized indian academy of pediatricians partnered with nagapatnam by bringing in their professionals for expert 
post disaster pediatric intervention a grievance redressal counter was set up to ensure free access to those who may have missed out on some relief measures coordination of loose ends was so necessary for a multi pronged delivery basic grievance police counter for spot fir as well as for insurance of death, issuance of death certificates to families of the deceased missing persons counter ngo counter health counter psychosocial support counter ngo material receipt counter relief issue counter were only some of the, those loose ends that needed concerted and mature redressal additional steps were taken up for further coordination which included controlled phone lines were started mobile phones supplied to field officers setting up of wireless systems for vedaranyam and additionally for nagapatnam state bank of india and other banks or treasuries were functioning on all days daily coordination team meetings of departments were done to sort out logistical issues special traffic squads formed to streamline the traffic relief brought in brought in convoys with escort to nagapatnam and mailad mailadu thurai i remember the name of the railway station 42 fire tenders and attendant staff for rescue special squads posted an outpost created to prevent theft in uh, affected areas special task force rapid action force and dog squads were pressed into service to to aid in disposal of bodies and corpses special task force rapid action force and dog squad brought in aid for disposal brought brought in to aid disposal of body the earthquake had heaven up land in places or land had subsided in many places the tsunami changed the whole landscape new sandbars seized the estuarine mouths of many rivers and rivulets effectively preventing fisher folk fisher folk from reaching the sea undersea bathymetric profile had changed affecting fishing grounds and marine nutrients that changed surf and currents created changes in weather patterns in the short and medium term these factors affected livelihoods of fishers the industries of tourism shipping trade economy aviation agriculture and a whole spectrum of human activity indeed humanity itself seemed paralyzed people had died their homes and hearts were destroyed their tools for livelihood were hammered and lost forever the survivors did not have anything more than the torn clothes that still clung to them so shocked were they that they could not muster the strength to complete funerals of the deceased family members volunteers filled in this crucial gap emotional paralysis is often the case with survivors of all natural calamities the debris the debris from the disaster can paralyze even the administration never otherwise is the significance of governance more critical in the chaotic situation prevalent in the aftermath of a calamity the responsibility of the government assumes a new at times personal meaning good officers who take charge will inspire faith in the destitute survivors such is the nature of responsible governance contrast with this with the self centered behavior of the assistant commissioner in great nicobar island in india who ordered immediately after the tsunami that all bottled water be brought to the official residence of the assistant commissioner you then know the difference between selflessness and selfishness responsible and responsive governance cannot just deliver relief to the affected but strengthen their capacities to so that their resilience to disaster increases administrators who take charge can indeed inspire volunteers bandwagon there were many survivors of the tsunami who for whom the scars of the tsunami would never heal some people who lost all their children to the killer waves rude the fact that they had undergone family planning operations for birth control some of the families lost all of their children during the relief teams visit to the affected by villages many of the women who had lost their children in the tsunami expressed the desire to get bigger to bigger children again they wanted to reverse their sterilization such women opted for recanalization which is a procedure that reverses sterilization through a micro surgery in the abdomen the procedure reopens the conduit for a woman's eggs to enter the fallopian tube again thus reversing sterilization the government had provided rupees 25000 for each case of recanalization around 18 such women have undergone desterilization or recanalization till now in different hospitals private as well as the government two of them geeta bhaskaran and kumari shivkumar of the akare pettai uh, village have conceived again says dr j radhakrishnan in an exclusive email given to me for this book talking of the pressing tasks on hand on the day of the tsunami dr radhakrishnan 
district collector of nagapatnam summarizes the priorities and enormity of the situation on hand which included rescue of survivors removal of the, and disposal of dead bodies evacuation of stranded people setting up of relief centers providing food for affected families restoration of electricity water supply communication links and transport infrastructure etc prevention of epidemics ensuring water and sanitation to survivors and providing treatment to injured survivors the administration in tamil nadu had to clear the debris disperse aid to the survivors house them in shelters arrange for food water and sanitation besides relief material medical care to the survivors rescue and treat the injured recover the corpses and deceased all at once not to forget was the arrangement for the dispersal of relief, relief material for which debris had to be cleared and infrastructure reconstructed at least temporarily other priorities like recovering the injured as well as the dead disposing of corpses decontamination fumigation completion of legalities reigniting the lives and livelihoods of fisher folk with relief and livelihood support was quintessential to their recovery networking the missing with the rescued were also part of the administration's responsibilities the steel frame of the country the bureaucracy was stretched to its limit reconstruction had to include concepts like earthquake safe architecture rainwater harvesting and cyclone safe shelters since the nagapatnam coast is highly vulnerable to cyclones storms floods besides the very rare tsunami this call for search for expert architects and sound research on earthquake safe or disaster safe shelter construction or disaster safe architecture a task that could easily ideally be assigned to ngos more than 419 ngos came forward to coordinate the aftermath of the tsunami thus an ngo coordination center was indispensable right from day one the district administration maintained extremely cordial relationship with the ngos ngos were grouped under medical teams hygiene and sanitation water supply counseling and mental health care coordinating housing temporary and permanent shelters repairing of boats reclamation of agricultural lands installation of effluent treatment plants for standardized sanitation infrastructure was another element of disaster risk reduction being incorporated operated into the development quotient ngos coordination center was entrusted with the responsibilities of daily coordination meetings conducted with ngos to sort out issues then and there ngo relief material was coordinated smoothly ngos were encouraged to set up rehabilitation and resource center meanwhile interim shelters were far from ideal condition they were Uh, they were small lacked in water and sanitation connections had zinc sheets for roofing and had to accommodate large families in shelters as small as 300 square feet the need for a trained team work was never more felt it justified the prognosis the asian tsunami was a watershed and a genesis for disaster management the experience of the officers the different countries affected by the tsunami led to documentation of best practices and drafting of policy guidelines to help evolve the drafting of the legislation disaster management act in india and similar legislation in sri lanka thailand and indonesia however the lessons learned from the asian tsunami were the guiding principles for establishing protocol for disaster response the legislation of the indian Na- national disaster management act defined protocols for for among other things interagency coordination and standard operating procedure standard operating procedure is critical standardization of response and mitigation effort india's democratic ethos affords affords niche operationalization the enactment of the disaster management act led to the establishment of national disaster management authority at the national level state disaster management authority at the state levels district disaster management authority at the district level and disaster management officers at the local village development council or the panchayati raj institutions too this offers not just decentralized governance but offers rapid rescue at the lowest levels of governance and also access to the first responders the immediate community community at the site of the disaster the aim of the disaster management act was to coordinate the disaster response and strengthen disaster mitigation or reduce the impact of calamities on human landscapes affected by the calamity by building resilience to disasters this was a major paradigm shift in disaster management from post disaster management to mitigation reducing the risk of impact of calamities on vulnerable people early warning and effective forecasting requires actionable inputs like evacuation of vulnerable groups communication of early warning and forecasting needs to be broadcast on text sms internet servers and portals radio and television channels ham radio network and news flash across news agencies early news bulletins by the communications officer of the ndm or disaster management agencies 
augments the efficacy of early warning and forecasting through the outreach and communication. Electronic display boards should be installed near shelters to maintain a database for networking missing people with survivors. Logistics for mass evacuation have to be arranged, often diverting military logistics for evacuation itself. Today, advances in science and technology have led to accurate methods of forecasting cyclones, avalanches, storms, floods, or even a tsunami's path, height, the coast likely to be affected, and the wave height. A number of official bodies and apparatus are deployed for implementing actions recommended by forecasting agencies. It is needless to reiterate the critical significance of mass transport infrastructure, buses, military trucks, vans, roads, bridges, highways, trains, ships, boats, ambulances, etc. All the vehicles must have trained staff on standby and enough resources like communication spectrum, fuel for vehicles, power supply, etc. to rush to the site of the disaster. On the day of the Asian tsunami, for instance, the district collector of Tanjaur or Tanjore was Dr. J. Radhakrishnan, who had to rush 176 buses and 32 ambulances to the worst affected district, neighboring Nagapatnam. 8,000 people were evacuated in 176 buses alone. That brings out the enormous significance of logistics and interagency coordination to you at one go. So, Evacuation vehicles with corresponding fuel storage are critical components of early warning. It is futile to imagine the number of lives that could have been saved in Nagapatnam had there been a tsunami early warning center for the Indian Ocean region. Even if the television media in India had reported at 8 a.m. that day, that fateful day, mm. the seismic waves had inundated Nicobars with loss of life. Thousands of lives could have been saved in Tamil Nadu, which was hit by the tsunami a good two hours later. In this case, hindsight is not perfect. A decade after the tsunami, there is no regular national coverage of issues affecting geologically volatile Andaman Nicobar Islands in mainland Indian press, television or radio. And the administration's immediate priorities were removal and safe disposal of dead bodies, restoration of water, electricity, roads, communication and transport, distribution of relief material, that is between government and NGOs, they had to do the coordination, reduce panic and pu build public confidence, build temporary shelters and get people back, restore other important services like schools, child welfare centers, health posts, etc. Supervise and start close or supervise and start or close the relief camps. Indeed, the world takes natural calamities much more seriously ever since. But alas, Nico Bars has one local privately managed 24 bar 7 television channel, even 10 years after the tsunami, or for that matter, 18 years after the tsunami. India's public broadcasters, All India Radio and Doordarshan which are state broadcasters, have a decade after the tsunami not received a written mandate to broadcast early warnings. This has been established as a fact through a written response to a right to information application filed by me. Doordarshan, the publicly funded television channel in India, made an improvised and discreet decision on its part in its uh, Port Blair station on the 11th of April 2012 when INCOIS, that is the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, issued a tsunami watch. Doordarshan Port Blair ran a text scroll of a tsunami alert in Nicobars on its normal programming, but All India Radio fell shy of even broadcasting a tsunami watch. The right to information reply that I got from All India Radio, Port Blair says, and I quote, This office has not been received by any tsunami alert on 11th of April 2012 as per record available in this office, unquote. There was typically no explanation as to why this glaring faux pas is ignored despite repeated press reports to this effect. Today, however, 10 years later and many disasters later, this is a what I've written in 2014. India's National Disaster Response Force is equipped, trained and stationed in different regional hubs in India for rapid rescue. Search and rescue is largely the forte of NDRF battalions, with each battalion stationed in different hubs specializing in search and rescue for different types of disasters that uh, each region of India is vulnerable to. For example, the search and rescue battalions in Himachal Pradesh and Jammu and Kashmir are trained for avalanche search and rescue, floods and landslides. The NDRF battalions in Bihar, Assam, Orissa are trained for floods and so on. A whole gamut of other agencies join in the disaster mitigation and response efforts. Earth excavation machines and earth moving equipment had to be brought in to Nagapatnam and from neighboring district of Tanjavur or Tanjore in Tamil Nadu. 
Volunteers from neighboring districts and states helped in mass mortality management because the scale and number of the dead could not be attended to immediately. Before decomposition set in by the administration alone and without extra human resources, they, they attended to it. The sheer scale of the disaster was mind-numbing to all involved. Simultaneously, police department rushed additional men from all over the state, particularly Trichy, Tanjore, etc. These men stand started doing search and rescue activities. Arrival of the police and volunteers helped in disposal of bodies speedily. Bodies that were strewn on the roads were brought back to common places like community halls, hospitals in Velangani and other places, says Dr. Radha Krishnan. The lesson learned from this experience was that the disaster mitigation re in revolves around logistics, interagency coordination and binding these efforts is the critical role of official communication agencies. Today, 10 years after the Asian tsunami, warning has matured and best practices, sorry, early warning has matured and best practices are continuously evolving with each new experience that is documented in the public domain and public discourse. Storage of food, survival rations, clothing, medicines and temporary shelters and arranging for doctors at shelters keeps the administration on its toes in the days before the calamity is expected to strike. First responders, including communities most at risk, should ideally be drilled with first aid and emergency response before help arrives. This calls for constant mock drills in calamity-prone or hazardous areas. Sirens and other early warning infrastructure should be regularly tested and functional. Uh, calling for uninterrupted power supply and communication hubs with very high bandwidth and spectrum. This is as far as disaster mitigation or disaster risk reduction is concerned. National Dis Disaster Response Force has specialized search and rescue teams. Search and rescue of the injured and missing survivors is as important as providing shelter, food, water and sanitation and clothing to traumatized survivors. Treatment of injured also needs priority as it can save lives. Often search and rescue needs immediate repair of damaged infrastructure like roads and bridges. Clearance of debris is critical to effective dispersal of aid and relief. Aid and relief material have to be distributed for which mobilization of logistics, often with military logistics, is undertaken in India. Many military personnel say the human resources of the armed forces and the military machine is best suited for disaster response in peacetime. Coordinating the arrival of foreign aid workers and foreign aid material is also important. Standard Operating Procedure and Disaster Management Act mandates that search and rescue teams has to be coordinated effort between the NDRF, SDRF, armed forces and paramilitary forces, home guards, volunteers, police, Red, district, Red Cross and so on. All personnel of all these force or teams must be trained in first aid. The state government, state disaster management authority has to coordinate in search and rescue efforts and report or update the status to national disaster management authority regularly. The NDMA in turn briefs the prime minister according to assessment or criticality of the situation. Contrast this with the staggered response on the day of the Asian tsunami. Since the epicenter of the massive earthquake was located in a neighboring country, neither the prime minister of India nor the crisis management group of the Union Cabinet was informed. Adding to this was the wrong decision that the epicenter was in a foreign country That was the f and the fact that it was a sleepy Sunday after Christmas also uh, made matters worse. Public Works Department Public Works Department is mandated with clearance of debris and damaged out structures. The Public Works Department is mandated to undertake emergency clearance of debris clearing of roads, as assemble casual labor, provide a work team carrying emergency toolkits depending on the nature of disaster, essential equipment such as towing vehicles, poke lanes, earth moving equipment and earth excavation machinery like cranes, poke lanes, JCBs, etc. need to be mobilized and kept on standby. The public works department must be ready to construct temporary roads to aid rapid dispersal of aid and relief. In the aftermath of the tsunami, the Indian Army constructed temporary roads in Tamil Nadu and Nicobar Islands. The Public Works Department must keep national and other main highways clear from disaster effects such as debris, etc. It falls on the Public Health Department to monitor the efficacy of public health preparedness. Public hospitals need to be stocked with HIV-safe blood supply, medicines, antibiotic, an antibiotics, anesthetics, diuretics for industrial, radiological and nuclear disasters, air ambulances, etc. Train teams for photo documentation of forensic pathology, necroscopy and mass mortality management. Refrigerated mortuaries, uninterrupted power supply and backup are needed for mass mortality management. 
India's Andaman Nicobar Islands fall short of WHO standards for mortal mass mortality management. In a written response to a right to information application filed by me, the Director of Health Services declares that the GB Panth Hospital in Port Blair in Andaman Nicobar Islands is the only hospital with a mortuary with a capacity of for storage of six cadavers only. It is not a refrigerated mortuary either. For more for more on mass mortality management, mass mortality management, please read and study chapter 4 in this book. Marine hospitals for geologically volatile Andaman Nicobar Islands or in far flung but cyclone prone Lakshadweep Islands too are part of the mandate in the standard operating procedure. Air ambulances are a must in geologically vulnerable areas. In Himachal Pradesh, some districts like Lahol and Spiti or Kelong are snowbound for about 8 to 9 months of the year. With glacial melt and climate change, these areas are more vulnerable to avalanches. At present, the practice for medical evacuation is elaborate, requiring the district administration to requisition the state government for helicopters for medical evacuation. Needless to reiterate is the need for air ambulances in such areas. Air ambulances are needed for medical evacuation in all districts of the subcontinent. An expensive investment, sure, but one that will save countless lives and livelihoods. Also, it will secure future generations against disasters. Investment in air ambulances has to become part of corporate social responsibility and also aided by UN agencies if possible. Air ambulances are critically necessary in India's 604 districts and in places like the Philippines and Indonesia. Health authorities should also ensure that private hospitals will respond to the disaster during calamities. Private medical practitioners in Tanjavur or Tanjore in Tamil Nadu attended to the thousands of fleeing from fear on the day of the tsunami. More often in India, it falls on the private media to scrutinize corruption in the government and report if medical preparedness or any other kind of preparedness is within stipulated norms or falls short. However, in remote rural areas, the government primary healthcare centers should be prepared and well stocked for the kind of calamities that occur in the region as there are hardly any private hospitals in rural areas. Since no health department in any state in India has maintained a registry of physically challenged people, it is necessary to tabulate details of frail, infirm, physically challenged people, nursing mothers, pregnant women, malnourished children in every district so that special care is extended to such more vulnerable people during emergency response. Access to evacuation, early warning and forecasting should be made compatible to the needs of visually challenged persons and speech and hearing impaired persons too. Needs of caregivers of and of mentally challenged people are like people with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, clinical depression or mentally disturbed people need they have special needs and they need to be focused to be included in disaster preparedness. Similar is the case for caregivers of spastic or autistic impaired persons. Such people are more vulnerable during disasters. The need for mental health care has was put eloquently by Dr. J. Radhakrishnan, who was collector of Nagapatnam when the tsunami struck. Says he, and I quote, Unlike the earlier disasters such as heavy winds and cyclones, tsunami was new to coastal Nagapatnam, and this had created a fierce psychosis in the minds of the brave fishermen and their families. This was evident from the from their act of not going out to the sea even though few boats and vallams were not affected and were fit for going into the sea. In the case of cyclones which periodically affects Nagapatnam district, the losses were limited to one particular area and except the fishermen, the family of the fisher folk were safe in the shore. Whereas in the case of tsunami, the losses were heavy on the shore rather than in the sea and this had caused a sense of uncertainty in the lives of family members. In order to bring them back to normal, lots of counselling had to be given. By means of awareness camps, folk dances, puppet shows and seminars arranged through various government departments and NGOs, the fisher folk were educated about the myth of surrounding tsunami. Dr. Elfin Titus, medical superintendent at the government-run BJR hospital in Karnikobar told me in an exclusive discussion, and I quote, that after the tsunami, the anxiety levels of the islanders has increased so much that the incidence of hypertension has increased and statistically, it can be clearly linked to the calamity. Not to forget or underestimate is the need for mental health support for survivors. Traumatized survivors are so shocked that they are often staring blankly for days, unable to even drink water or eat. It can have a psychological impact. During relief for the Asian tsunami survivors, the affected fisher folk in Tamil Nadu dared not put out to sea. Such was the fear of the tsunami. Other survivors and Nicobars, like Captain Obed Janata, for instance, could not speak for a full six months after the calamity 
as he lost his sons and wife in the tsunami. The fishing communities were psychologically affected as they could not digest the fact that the mother sea, which was their source of life, could destroy them, says Dr. J. Radhakrishnan. A newspaper report in the Hindu featured measures taken by the ad district administration of Nagapatnam with a photograph showing Do DC Dr. J. Radhakrishnan putting out to sea with affected fishermen and army personnel in an effort to assuage the fear struck survivors and motivate them to reclaim their livelihood. This incident only underscores the need for mental health interventions as part of emergency response. Needless to reiterate, of course, is a, is a strong leader inspiring leadership that restores faith of the survivors. Health departments should also maintain sanitation infrastructure like sewage disposal at uncompromising standard. Both toilets and shelters as well as sewage treatment plants have to be functional at optimal levels always. Maintenance has to be scrutinized as part of disaster preparedness. Water desalination plants in coastal areas have to be always maintained and tested for functionality after early warning or forecasting has been sounded. Best way to achieve this is with regular testing. In Nicobars, sirens are tested with the mock drill on the 3rd and 18th of every month and sirens are in good working condition. The same cannot be said of sirens in Banda, Aceh in Sumatra, Indonesia. Power supply must be ensured at, as it is an essential service. Communication networks and hubs, hospitals, early warning infrastructure, logistics for search and rescue, as well as distribution of aid and relief, treatment of injured, monitoring of relief and aid, mortuaries in hospitals and operation theatres in hospitals all need uninterrupted power supply. Power supply departments may also have to import or buy power supply from other states with surplus power during calamities because during calamities like cyclone strike, power pylons and transmission hubs are often destroyed or damaged, impairing power supply in the immediate aftermath of cyclones. It thus helps for power supply departments to buy additional power supply if it is expected after forecasting that power supply will be affected during the imminent calamity. Power generation being part of the crucial infrastructure needs to be incorporated into the development quotient in planning for disaster risk reduction. District administration must document the paucity or, or deficit of power supply and the power supply infrastructure in disaster safe seasons. District administration must also document the need for power supply import depending on the deficit. Such a ready to refer database certainly helps in disaster mitigation during calamities. Revenue Department along with the Department for Food and Civil Supplies is mandated with coordination of relief and supplies. Food stocks, survival rations for those yet to be rescued, hygiene products, clothing, medicine, toiletries, provide shelter to volunteers and medical staff on deputation, coordinate facilities for mass cooking, cooking that is culture sensitive and rich in nutrition. To coordinate bulk distribution of emergency supplies, ensure timely delivery of food, medicines, clothing, hygiene products and toiletries as also part of the revenue department's mandate. The revenue department is also best equipped and best qualified to make rapid assessment and detailed assessment of damage to lives, livelihood and livestock based on which compensation guidelines are revised or formulated as the case may be. An online database of assets, liabilities, income and exp expenditure, consumption patterns and human development index can also help in expediting relief. Thus, it should be the goal of every revenue department official to create such an exhaustive demographic online profile if only for emergency response. And that is what India's Aadhaar does. Care must be taken to provide full privacy and some details like email IDs should be protected mandatorily. It should be the aim of revenue department of every state and union territory in India and all the administrative units in disaster prone South and Southeast Asia to identify vulnerable population and areas for construction and establishment of temporary shelters in all identified hazardous vulnerable areas. The Department of Urban Development, Local Self Governments and Institute of Public Health need to take up the responsibility of clean water supply to survivors in all shelters. UNICEF has arranged for massive amounts of water through supply of water bladders during the Asian tsunami relief after the Kashmir earthquake and after the Haiti earthquake but is dependent on local government infrastructure and logistics for de delivery and dispersal. Awareness campaigns must be undertaken by the local governments to disseminate the need to conserve water and not waste water at any cost. Ideally, water treatment plants should be functional so that treated water is used for secondary purposes 
purposes like sanitation, if only to ensure that fresh water is not wasted. The lone desalination plant on the Chaura Island in Nicobar did not serve its purpose because of rejection of treated water by the indigenous people before the tsunami. By the time the tsunami plant by the time of the tsunami, the plant was defunct and dysfunctional. In the post-tsunami period, all Nicobaris make do with the water supplied by the island administration, uh, including this uh, desalination plant. This agenda is part of incorporating the development quotient into disaster risk reduction. Maintenance of sanitation infrastructure, separating water supply lines from sanitation lines is needless to reiterate of paramount importance. In chapter 13, we have dealt with water and sanitation in great detail, profiling the health risks that come from inadequate sanitation in the immediate aftermath of the Asian tsunami. It is, it is the Department of Urban Development in the City Municipal Council or Village Development Council that has to undertake the responsibility of infrastructure support for portable water distribution. Other responsibilities in line with water and sanitation include procurement of clean drinking water, transportation of water with minimum wastage, special care for women with infants and pregnant women, ensure that sewer pipes and drainage pipes are kept separate from drinking water facilities. The Department of Revenue must coordinate with Urban Development Authority, Public Work Department and Village Development Council called Panchayati Raj Institutions in India to provide adequate and appropriate shelter to all the population, quick assessment and identifying the area for the establishment of the relief camps, identification of public buildings as possible shelters, identifying the population which can be provided with support in their own place and need and need not be shifted or relocated, locate relief camps close to public transport links. A media liaison officer or public relations officer must be the epitome of efficiency and central nervous system of the control room. He or she should not should be able to give out press releases by the hour the moment early warning is sounded. The public relations officer must be capable of 1. Leading news teams and reporters with sources of information, planting stories that escape the attention of the mainstream reporters, provide communication facilities for visiting media personnel, arrange board lodging, water and communication hubs and high-speed Wi-Fi internet connections at hubs, logistics etc. for media personnel, provide media advisories on best practices of disaster mitigation to media personnel, maintain a press clippings file either in hard copy or soft copy of all press reports of the coverage of the incident uh, conduct background check of foreign press wherever possible a military spy of an Asian giant posed as a reporter to visit Nicobar after the Asian tsunami you can imagine who organize a press briefing by assigned officers every evening for a minimum of three weeks after calamity strike updates on status quo of relief recovery aid distribution on web portal as often as possible preferably at regular half Half day intervals, create a database of officials responsible for queries from media personnel, articulate the standpoint of the administration or the government, lies with NGOs, aid agencies, activists, officers and media, welcome foreign aid workers, help them by arranging accommodation transport, food and water besides communication facilities for them. A press room with the best communication facilities are indispensable. Lies with volunteers to assort donations and supply of relief material. Lies with railways to coordinate relief supplies that arrive from all over the country. Ensure customs clearance of foreign relief supplies with requisite documentation. Provide a list of do's and don'ts on culture sensitive reporting to the media. Present a list of do's and don'ts for safety of reporters teams in the calamity struck area where aftershocks or after effects as the case may be. Keep recurring in the aftermath of natural calamities. Provide an access number to visiting media personnel indicating the times for accessibility. Provide security to visiting media personnel. Arrange for translation into English and regional language. All the interviews to all visiting media personnel. Uh, uh, Chinese and Japanese. Arrange for translation of all press material into German, Russian, Spanish, French, Arabic, Chinese and Japanese for the benefit of foreign media personnel. Arrange for accreditation to visiting media personnel in the interest of internal security. Arrange for photo documentation of the calamity with captions and statistics, name and contact details of potential interviewees. Advisories need to be given to media personnel about discrete reporting of children, gender issues and culture sensibilities. Help media personnel contact the survivors. Arrange for video footage for visiting media personnel wherever possible in high, high definition camera footage. Provide and collect reliable information on the, on the status of the disaster and disaster victims for effective coordination of relief work at state level. Going the 
sorry guide the media personnel not to intrude on the privacy of individuals and families while collecting information coordinate with eoc or the emergency operation center at the airport and railways for required information for international and national relief workers acquire accurate and up to date scientific information from the ministry of science and technology and the designated agencies for information dissemination coordinate with all television and radio networks to send news flashes for specific needs of donation delivery guidelines to private television and radio channels to flash disaster news as and when delivered respect the socio cultural and the emotional state of the disaster victims while collecting information for dissemination and be an articulate spokesman of the administration additionally if if the media liaison officer or the public relations officer hands out a printed rti form to visiting activists and media personnel it enhances the faith and credibility as well as the endearment of the pro by leaps and bounds it also offers transparency and credibility willingness to be transparent through rti creates incredible amounts of credibility in the aftermath of the asian tsunami it fell on pr teams to allay fears for more tsunamis and to mitigate the spread of rumor mongering tsunami rumors were tackled by the confidence building measures and word of mouth denial in addition vehicle fit vehicles fitted with public address system were stationed with wireless sets in coastal habitations to nip the rumors in the bud so to say relentless campaign through mass media against possible recurrence of tsunami helped mitigate the fear after a few weeks village level committees formed to allay the fears of the villagers and friends of police youth volunteers started to recap then interagency coordination or intersectoral disaster mitigation calls for a three pronged effort intersectoral approach for disaster mitigation stage 1 includes search and rescue recovery food security water supply sanitation and hygiene combating breakout of the epidemic mitigate crime counseling effective communication and disposal of the dead stage 2 compensation reconstruction interim recreation or reconstruction of infrastructure relief and rehabilitation standardization of procedure disaster proof reconstruction inventorize community assets and community infrastructure for compensation and aid photo documentation of inventories streamline revenue records and create database of assets and records and to do lists and the tasks of the communities and the state compile stocks and supplies for emergencies psychiatric counseling and care has to be instituted or facilitated and palliative health care has to be made available stage 3 livelihood facilitation awareness creation for disaster preparedness training for rescue rehab first aid etc risk assessment hazard mapping capacity building communication drive for awareness infrastructure recreation community mapping of human resources mapping of needs infrastructural facilities budgets expertise community assets and liabilities for disaster preparedness and agricultural produce seasonal calendar mapping and inventory in this chapter an attempt has been made to capture the quintessential prerequisites of intersectoral disaster mitigation the list is by no means complete growth comes with experience and documentation of experiences in the public domain it is nevertheless hoped that the public documentation based on experience will help save lives and livelihoods and mistakes will not recur that however does not mean that evolved best practices like water and sanitation to indigenous people should be subject to debate by advocacy groups but at the bottom line must remain an aim to make the entire set of survivors feel like family with the administration as a leader in command So you see why disaster mitigation or disaster risk reduction needs interagency coordination now. With interagency coordination, the risk to which individual, sorry, the risk to which vulnerable groups of people are exposed to during calamities can be reduced. That, in essence, is the aim of disaster risk reduction. Disaster risk reduction is a systematic approach to identifying, assessing, and reducing risks. of disaster by reducing exposure to hazards lessening vulnerability of people and property wise management of land and environment and improving coping capacity and preparedness against disasters says dr j radhakrishnan former collector of nagapatnam during the asian tsunami relief in an exclusive discussion with me quoting his own experience dr radhakrishnan says and i quote there is still a long way to go in interagency coordination to optimally incorporate disaster risk reduction into the development agenda mostly only contingency plans are available for post disaster response than mitigation efforts on a preventive basis there is still 
so no systematic effort to include the disaster risk reduction into development. Focus is still on rescue and relief, not on preparedness. DDMA, SDMA, NDMA should be vibrant and not linked only to the disaster period. There is a need for effective coordination, visible common sense, result-oriented actions. Men, material and money are issues. There is a need for eff effective interstate, inter-district coordination. Need to make SDMAs and DDMAs operational. There is a dire need for complementary gap-filling approach approach among departments and not competitive approach. The attempt in this chapter is to document as much in, in as much detail as possible what we know today and is by no means an exhaustive or a complete list. Disaster mitigation is learning is a learning process and public documentation certainly helps in mitigating disaster to that extent in the next disaster. And that is all for tonight. With this we have finished chapter 21 on interagency coordination for disaster mitigation. The next chapter is on BioShields for Disaster Mitigation, which will be covered in two episodes on the 12th and the 19th of March 2022. I hope to catch you during the live interaction next week after the video. Uh, and tomorrow also, that is on um, 5th of March also, there is going to be a live interaction to uh, complete the chapter on the interagency coordination. So until then, take care, keep smiling, stay home and stay safe. Ciao.